Singapore is often held up as a success story. In just a matter of decades, the city-state has transformed itself from a colonial trading port to a buzzing global city. It's Asia's richest country with a per capita GDP that surpasses the UK and the US. It has world-class infrastructure, efficient transportation and affordable housing. But in recent years, Singapore has faced challenges on multiple fronts. Can it strike a balance between economic growth and environmental sustainability and still build a model for the city of tomorrow? I'm Haslinda Amin, and this is Momentum. Say Singapore, and you'd be forgiven for thinking crazy rich Asians. When it comes to economic achievements, Singapore stands tall. This tiny country in Southeast Asia is smaller in size than New York City, but it is a global financial center. It is also one of the world's biggest oil trading hubs and runs one of the world's highest rated airports, as well as one of the world's busiest ports. Its success is a product of decades of planning and implementation by a party that's been in power since independence. But in recent years, the party had its worst ever showing. To continue to prosper, Singapore needs to evolve. Its economic growth has slowed and its population is aging fast. It also faces an existential threat, climate change. As a low-lying tropical nation, it's particularly vulnerable to rising sea levels and heat waves. To solve some of these problems and future-proof itself, Singapore is turning to science and technology. Currently, Singapore is heavily reliant on imported natural gas. To meet its goal of achieving net zero by 2050 and mitigate the impacts of climate change, it needs to shift to renewable energy. So Singapore is trying to boost renewable production at home. However, options are limited. There are no major rivers for hydro and there isn't sufficient wind to power large commercial wind turbines. But there is sunshine throughout the year, making harnessing solar power the most viable option. Singapore ramped up its solar capacity by more than a thousand times in the last 15 years. I'm here in Tengi, one of the world's largest inland floating solar farms. Tengi has over 120,000 solar panels across an area equivalent to 45 soccer fields. It's run by Singapore's national water agency, PUB, and state-owned company, Semcorp. A 45 hectare floating solar farm. How is this part of future-proofing Singapore amidst a backdrop of higher demand for energy, also a climate crisis? So if you talk about high demand, so maybe let's just bring back to PUB, the work that we do. If you look at Singapore's water demand, we project it to increase almost double by 2065. We will need to use more of our, our weather resilient sources, which is basically desalinated water and new water, which is our recycled water. And these sources are more energy intensive our carbon footprint is expected to more than double in 2065 because of these sources. With that context, we need to look into harnessing renewable energy for Singapore. Solar energy is perfect for Singapore, but we are land scarce. So we need to find more innovative ways for Singapore's energy. So reservoir, actually the main function is of course to collect the rainwater uh, before we treat the water to produce drinking water. But if you look at the expense of the reservoir space itself, it also provides us with the opportunity to have a more large-scale deployment of solar panels on the reservoir surface. 
Compared to installing solar panels on rooftops, putting solar panels on water keeps them cool and increases the efficiency. Covering a reservoir with solar panels also reduces evaporation, which helps the reservoir store rainwater for longer. The electricity generated by the solar farm is used to power PUB infrastructure. It reduces 32 kilotons of carbon emissions annually, equivalent to taking 7,000 cars off the roads, according to Semcorp. So for Tengi, it's 60 megawatt peak, and 60 megawatt peak basically can power about 16,000 flats. We know there are 17 reservoirs in Singapore. It only makes sense for you to have more floating solar farms. I would say the success of this solar thing farm, of course, does give us the confidence to try it out in other reservoirs. And we are doing that, but it does require more studies because each reservoir is quite unique in their layout. So we do have plans over the next five years to implement large-scale floating solar farms at two more of our reservoirs. So the plan is to have a combined capacity of more than 150 megawatt peak. So imagine if we do for the two reservoirs, it will be over 150. I think if you convert that, that's about another 40,000 flats that we can power. Rizwan, if we want to replicate this floating solar farm elsewhere in the world, in another country, what are some of the takeaways that you can share with the others? From our experience, it's really about how do you optimize the land space and I think this multifunctional use is one area that cities or countries in a similar position as PUB can explore. Besides optimizing land use, Tengi Solar Farm was designed to maximize efficiency from the very beginning. I think one of the things about solar farm is firstly, the design has to be right at the start so that you have a very minimal maintenance requirements over the next 25 years. I guess a solar farm is actually not as complicated as a power plant, but in order to make sure that you have an effective and productive solar farm, we have to depend a lot on data analytics and predictive analytics to help ensure efficiency and ensure the best performance of the plant. Speaking of perfection, I mean, the solar panels are actually angled at five degrees. Yes. One would imagine that the best way to maximise um, energy collection is when it's flat. Singapore is, you know, near the equator, so the best efficiency from global solar irradiance is really at zero degrees. But we know that zero degrees will increase soiling. When it rains, you have dust and all that, it will affect the performance and the efficiency of the system. So before constructing this solar farm, we actually have quite a number of existing solar farms uh, on the rooftops, right? And we have some at 3 degrees, some at 5 degrees. So we looked at the data and we realised actually 5 degrees has the best performance. 5 degrees allows for the sunlight and the air to flow through and we have angled it towards the north, which means the direction of the wind. So it actually improves the diversity, the biodiversity, the air, the water quality as well. Jen, how are you able to counter concerns that these solar panels impede the quality of uh, the water and also the wildlife here? We actually have a very comprehensive environmental management and monitoring plan that we adhere to. So one such example is uh, setting eight camera traps to track the wildlife here. We also have three water quality monitoring stations where we collect data and submit it on a weekly basis to monitor the performance of the water quality. We coexist extremely well with the wildlife. One fun fact is we had nine otters here back in 2021. <laughs> Today they have grown to 14 otters and they're pretty happy. They come out at five o'clock to play. So it's data-driven, Yes. it's science-driven. Yes. Do you continue to monitor and what do you do with the data? How does the data you collate, you get, is translated to improvements down the road? 
Yeah, so I think there's a lot of data collected at this solar farm. So we start with the system, we collect temperature data, we collect you know, inverter data, we collect generation data and so on. So that's translated to analytics where we monitor losses through soiling, um, losses through temperature and then we do improvements. We don't just go cleaning for the sake of cleaning. We do have a lot of birds around and birds sometimes soil the solar panels. So when, when that happens, our digital analytics actually captures. So we send the team out to, to do some cleaning. Singapore's solar capacity has grown significantly over the years. But because of limited space, solar is unlikely to form a large share of Singapore's energy mix. The city-state will still need to import renewable energy from other countries. But natively generated renewables could account for over 60% of Singapore's energy mix by 2050, and hydrogen could be a major renewable source. Case in point is Singapore's PUB's collaboration with American startup Aquatic on a $20 million demonstration plant for carbon capture and hydrogen production. The ocean is already the planet's most powerful carbon removal tool. Aquatic's technology aims to do what the ocean does in a faster and better way, while also producing hydrogen, a clean fuel that could one day power the grid transportation and heavy industry. Here's how it works. First, seawater is pumped into Aquatic's plant. Then, electrolysis break the seawater into hydrogen, oxygen, and a base stream and an acid stream. The base stream is exposed to air, which helps create the reaction that forms solid carbonates and dissolve bicarbonates. These carbonates and bicarbonates are captured carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The acidified stream is neutralized with rock. The two streams are mixed and returned to the sea. The discharged seawater is treated, so it preserves the same chemical composition as the ocean to avoid damaging the marine ecosystem. The technology could potentially be integrated into PUB's water desalination operations, the National Water Agency said. The team had run a pilot project in Singapore for over a year, removing up to 100 kilograms of carbon dioxide per day. The demonstration plant will capture about 3,650 metric tons of carbon dioxide and produce over 100 tons of hydrogen annually, according to the company. But ocean CO2 removal technologies like aquatics are nascent and costly. The long-term impacts of these projects on the marine environment are not well understood. Housing is another piece of the puzzle towards remaking Singapore as a city of the future. 80% of Singapore's population live in government-built flats. The Housing and Development Board, which plans and builds such housing, has come up with its greenest project ever, Tunga New Town. Tunga is part of Singapore's effort to reduce its carbon footprint and to promote sustainability in energy, water, and waste. It will be the first HDB town that is planned with smart technologies town-wide from the beginning. It will have a car light town center, smart lighting, automated trash collection, and a solar-powered centralized cooling system, an eco-friendly alternative to conventional air conditioning. Instead of using refrigerants to remove heat, it uses chilled water piped into homes from centralized chillers. It's based on a commercial system in Singapore's Marina Bay Financial District, where refrigeration plants and pipes were laid underground before the offices were built. 
The systems operator, SP Group, says the network can save up to 30 gigawatt hours per year, equivalent to taking 4,500 cars off the road. The HDB has been using 3D environmental modeling software to create the blueprint for Tunga, simulating the effects of changes in wind, temperature and sunlight on buildings and their surroundings. The aim was to find the best way to mitigate the urban heat island effect. When we talk about public housing, for most part of the world, it is a problem. For Singapore, it is a solution. And Singapore has gone one step up because it's gone high tech using technology to solve public housing issues. So one of the very cutting edge technology that we have deploy and implement in our daily um, design works is the Integrated Environmental Modular, which is called IEM. So this IEM is a technology that we can simulate the environmental parameters before the actual construction starts. Before Tunga, the 3D modelling software was used to design Singapore's first smart and sustainable district, Pongol North Shore. We translate the design in the virtual world to the actual developments. We have studied different physics, including wind flow. So you can see this district having a staggered kind of building layout, which introduced the wind flow and natural ventilations into the precincts. What you are seeing here now is the North Shore district at the 6 p.m. time. So you can see that there are a very huge portion of the areas in this district are being covered by the shadow. So which means that uh, our residents can have enjoyable time using those amenities. The beauty of it is that we conduct one simulation. There are different parameters that we can study at once. For example, what you can see here, we got wind speed, we got shading, we got ambient temperature, we got humidity and even thermal comfort levels. So our archi and our planners can really study their designs from different kind of angles and achieve an optimized building layout before the construction starts. How cost effective is such an approach to public housing? Last time, we might study them in silo. For example, wind flow, we might need one software. Solar, we need to use the other one. But IEM is really the cutting edge technology to bring in them all together in one platform. Using IEM, we can reduce the cost on environmental modeling study. In Singapore, we are an island. We have having limited land space. So we have to make use of this kind of technology to strategically deploy or implement our mitigation measures in tackling the heat-related issues. Apart from using smart technology to optimize building design, the HDB is also doubling down on greenery. Vegetation can reduce air temperature as well as provide shade. For decades, it has been a key tool in the city's fight to keep temperatures down. Already known as the Garden City, Singapore still plans to plant a million more trees by 2030. For Tanga, the goal was to create an evergreen forest town by using biophilic design, a concept that was tested in Pongol. Lanet, we're in Pongol, the yeah. first sustainable town in Singapore. Uh -huh. It's not just sustainable, it is smart, it is biophilic, and by that we mean a lot of greeneries here. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, Pongol, Pongol Town is our living laboratory where we tested a lot of smart, sustainable and biophilic features within the whole district and town. Now, biophilic comes from the word biophilia, which uh, refers to man's affinity with nature. And it's also our natural liking for living things. When you talk about biophilic design, it is the features that allows man to reconnect with nature, to enjoy the natural benefits that it offers. When we try to conceptualize this biophilic town framework, it is an effort to provide a holistic science-based approach into how we can provide greenery in a way that helps to provide greater sense of place, helps to provide better well-being for people and provide an enhanced quality of life for our residents. 
we considered five different aspects soil, water, flora and fauna, outdoor comfort and people and outdoor comfort is an aspect that we put a lot of effort into to ensure that our spaces are uh, comfortable to enjoy across different times of the day. So what do you see here? How has that been applied yeah. in Pongol here? I mean, how the trees are planted, for instance? Well, because a lot of analysis has been done before we actually design and plan, the trees, the way they are planted, for example, they are in alignment with the way the wind flows during the prevailing monsoon months. So when people are walking along the footpaths, they are actually enjoying a lot more breeze than they would otherwise. So particularly where places where people are enjoying the spaces, indulging in outdoor activities, we concentrate more efforts to ensure those spaces are well shaded from the sun. It's either through greenery or either through the neighbouring block uh, that casts a shade to that area. This is important. Singapore has always been seen as a concrete jungle. Mm, mm. The temperatures are very high. Yeah. And given the design that we have here and the greenery that we have in Pongo, yeah. the temperature is actually lower. Yeah, that's true. In terms of the amount of greenery and the way we plant the plants in the different places, it helps to lower the temperatures quite significantly. So there's a difference between uh, some of the towns that has been designed with such efforts and versus uh, other places that has not been done so. So I imagine that a lot of the residents here spend a lot of time outdoors, more so yeah. compared to the other more mature, older estates. Yeah, we definitely see a lot more people enjoying the spaces uh, across all the different times of the day. And it's very heartening to see families coming together, enjoying spaces like uh, our ponds and our butterfly gardens, learning about nature, appreciating what nature has to offer and ultimately having a greater quality of life. So far, over 5,700 apartments in Tonga have been delivered to buyers. When fully developed, the new town will provide 30,000 public housing units and 12,000 private housing units. But, according to local media reports, Tonga has had some initial problems. Some buyers have said the cooling system didn't work properly, while others complained about limited transport and blocked paths. In response, HDB said it takes time to build infrastructure for new towns, while cooling system operator SP Group said it has repaired most of the affected cooling units. In landscare's resource-poor Singapore, Every detail of its urban landscape is meticulously planned. Singapore's urban planning has created a city of the future, one where environmental sustainability and urban convenience intersect. Singapore's efforts to future-proof itself may not be replicable to many bigger countries, but for smaller places facing similar problems, there are lessons to learn. Check out our next Momentum episode. <laughs>